was exactly in these suburbs that much of the vitality of the Victorian city was to be found socially, architecturally and religiously. We can see this clearly for ourselves in the contrast between, say, George and Fitzwilliam Street in the upper corner and Victorian Clyde Road only a short distance away. The smell of fresh cut timber and of new mortar was not really a rare occurrence in Victorian Dublin. But because they were not part of the now sanctified Georgian era, they have been ruthlessly maltreated and continue to be. So the Dublin of my remarks today is the great conurbation of Dublin, the real Dublin in so many ways, the Dublin where large numbers of Dubliners actually live out important parts of their lives. And in Victorian times, a large part of that life was focused on religion and for large numbers of Dubliners, that meant the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church, an important distinction must be made between, of, between the Catholic Church of, say, 1780, when so many parish records have their beginnings, and let us say again, the 1870s. Between these two dates, the Catholic Church was transformed, a change from a pattern of small chapels into an organization of elegant churches. In my mind, the transformation of the Catholic Church is illustrated by a fact that anyone can check for themselves in the parish records, which are now online, of course. When you look into the 18th century and early 19th century Georgian church records, one sees that as often as not, the books were kept by the parish clergy in a very haphazard, higgledy-piggledy way, frequently with the sections for marriages, baptisms, and burials, all confused, written in a poor hand in a form that is often hard to read in poor quality semi-bound books that are now disintegrating. But by the 1860s this had changed. The records are now kept in large printed volumes carefully ruled, strongly bound in leather or buckram, standard in all parishes using Latin. Moreover the names are entered in a Latinized form, transforming Charles into Carolus, James into Jacobus. These books one can see for oneself, but there were other books which one never sees or hears alluded to. These were private parochial records, compiled by the clergy household by house household, in which were recorded the religious state of every Catholic in the parish, their marital status, number of children, attendance at church, the frequentation of the sacraments. They give, so to speak, an image of the soul of the parish. They were used down to a very recent date, but with each change of parish priests, they were, so I am told by a friend with experience of, in running several parishes, destroyed. Certainly there seem to be none in any Irish archive. But you will realize that the parish priest and his curates had through these books an exact picture as they sought of entire neighborhoods. There was no such thing as a private life for a Catholic in those days. This was reflected, uh, this reflected a, a new and abiding sense of control in the Catholic Church, discipline, a sense that everything was provided for by authority. This image is of the meeting and of the Synod of Thurlis. These changes in the Catholic Church are often associated with the name of Cardinal Cullen, but they came about as a consequence of the Synod of Thurlis in 1850, the first formal meeting of the Irish hierarchy since 1642. What had arrived was a transmontane sense of the influence of distant Rome on daily life. It's significant that a graph of the frequency of the use of this word, derived from France to describe what many liberal Catholics saw as an undue Italian influence on what were properly French concerns, suggests it reached a peak in about 1880. It is now an increasingly rare word certainly an ordinary conversation. It was during the course of this period that the Roman collar so often associated with the Victorian priest came into prominence. But that collar, then a new fashion, was a, and now a, a fetish for traditionalists, was less significant than the general appearance of parish priests. In the advertisements at the back of the Catholic directory, an annual volume, which became greatly enlarged over the last half of the 19th century. The advertisements for several clothing suppliers show the latest clerical fashions, for men that is. Significantly, I've seen no ads for nuns' garbs. 
these clothes were not clerical in quite the same way that they were on the continent, however. In France, Spain, Germany, Italy, and to a very small extent in England, Catholic clergy wore a very distinctive clerical garb, one which at times in some jurisdictions was even outlawed by legislation. But the Dublin advertisements show the clergy here dressed in long black frock coats with a silk top hat. This was not so much clerical garb as known on the continent, but the uniform of the United Kingdom professional class, the doctors, surgeons, barristers, bankers, financiers, senior civil servants. It was to this professional and administrative class that the parish clergy saw themselves as naturally belonging. The education needed to become a priest was most easily available to the comfortable and prosperous middle classes, and so it was their sons that provided most of the priests. This was socially inevitable, though it mimicked the allocation of occupations found among Protestant families. The priest was an important social figure, less a religious one. Theologically, the Irish Catholic Church of the period was unremarkable. The highest reaches of theology seem not to have concerned the clergy much. The pages of the Irish ecclesiastical record from 1864 onwards reveal a steady unadventurousness. It is significant that this official journal of the Irish hierarchy ceased publication in 1850, 1956, rather, just as the new tides of theological and social thought were passing through Catholic clerical and lay channels. In Victorian times, there were fewer professions as compared with now, when an immense range of professions that did not exist in Victorian times are now open, not just to mid middle class children, but to a more diversely educated population. In Victorian times, illiteracy was common before universal education. Today, never, ev nearly everyone is assumed to be literate. But this meant that the large numbers of priestly vocations in Victorian times were for reasons of social status rather than spiritual necessity. This was almost inevitable. There is now little need to use the priesthood to achieve a professional status, so vocations have declined and have, but have improved in quality. This meant, of course, that the Victorian priest was driven more by social considerations than by, by a true spiritual vocation. The priest, though seen as a spiritual figure, was in reality part of the administrative structure of the city, along with, say, city and township councillors. Their role in politics derived less from the teachings of the church than from the social needs of their class, their kinsmen, in the professions and in commerce. I will now turn to a matter of what can be seen and recalled of the Catholic churches of the Victorian era. This is St. Peter's out in Fibsborough, as it was um, at the start of the Victorian era, uh, reign. The Catholic Church in penal times lasted, in a technical sense, down to Catholic Emancipation Act of 1829, an act we in Ireland so often forget applied to the whole of the United Kingdom, as did the penal laws. However, those penal laws began to pass into abeyance in the 1780s, in any case, after the last Jacobite attempt to restore Vizet Armas, the crown, to the Stuarts. By the 1790s, they were more or less a dead letter. The Catholic Church of Penal Times was an organisation of back streets. At first, the back street mass houses developed into small chapels, and these in turn were replaced by proper churches from 1780s onwards. The churches can be divided up between the older chapels of the inner city and the nearby suburbs, such as the church at Camtele or Booterstown, or the older buildings standing on the slope below Mount Marion Parish Church. There are forgotten aspects, however, of the city churches. Newman's University Church is rightly seen in its Byzantine style as one of the remarkable, most remarkable of the city's churches. There is a social aspect to this place on Stephen's Green, which I have not seen pointed out anywhere. This was the church most familiar to me from my own childhood, as I recall it from the 1950s. There were two doors into the body of the nave on the left and the right at the end of the long entrance foyer. 
The door on the left led to the front pews, the door on the right led to the back pews under the gallery. The gallery itself with the organ was reached by a narrow winding stair from the foyer. Now to use the front pews on entering one made a larger offering, let's say sixpence or a shilling, than to use the back pews under the gallery. The gallery was free. Now these social divisions were reinforced by the fact that the back pews were actually railed off from the front of the nave. It was impossible to pay a few pence and slip forward from the back to the front, which was reserved for the wealthier parishioners and for the elite associated with University College and later UCD. About 20 years ago, I thought I would photograph this interesting aspect of the social life of Catholic, Victoria, Catholic Church in Victoria and Dublin. But to my surprise, I found the rails had been quietly removed. Indeed, I have in conversation had even the existence of this pen for the lower classes denied to me. Yet, here it is, here are the railings in the lower right-hand corner, as you can see, um, um, in the photograph taken in the 1960s. Now, that this sort of thing, which might well be called religious apartheid, may seem surprising to our minds, but it took other forms. University Church was created in the 1850s, but it was not unique in one way. Let us take, for instance, the Catholic Church on Westland Row, of St. Andrews in Westland Row. The Georgian Chapel had been in Townsend Street in a block framed by Tara Street and Hawkins Street. It was a rambling, ramshackle of edifice hidden away, as was then required by law, behind a screen of houses. It was used by parishioners from a wide area. For example, Conan Doyle's great-grandfather and his family in the first decades of the 19th century who lived off Dame Street came there. Significantly, in the late 1830s, this chapel was replaced largely through the urgings of Daniel O'Connell, whose town mansion was on Marion Square by the present Greek Revival Church that is so imposing a presence on Westland Road today. When the church was built, Greek revival, of course, was thought to be the most appropriate ecclesiastical style. But its contrast with what went before tells its own story. The church was des designed and built for the Catholic grandees of Marion Square District professional people like O'Connell. The arrangement inside had recently been changed by the reduction of a number of pews, but I cannot recall that in the past there were railings or pens. But in this case, there may have been no need for them. When you reach the end of Western Row and cross over to Lombard Street South, you enter at the end of that street another parish which was carved out of the old St. Andrews. This is the parish of City Quay. And this was specially built, it seems to me, to accommodate the dockers and other laborers and their families who inhabited the warren of slums south of the Keys. The boundary of the parish was carefully drawn so that it included respectable merchants in the eastern part of Pierce Street, such as the Pierce family, but excluded the tenements crowded into other streets a little to the west, such as Sandwich Street. Here too there were large numbers living, often in single rooms, but these lower orders were slavely kept away from the nice people of Marion Square, Haddington Road and Sandymount. The same sort of arrangement can be seen in the separation of Ring's End, a parish largely of working class people, boatmen, fishermen, boat builders, from the more respectable Sandy Mount in 1905. A feature of these Victorian churches, one carried over from previous centuries of course, were the large pulpits mounted on the walls. This is again University Church from which the preacher could be heard by the whole assembly. They were, the ex they were exclusive, exclusively reserved for the clergy, but of course are no longer used today. But in the 19th century, they were also used for the preaching of charity sermons by the powerful and popular speakers of the era, often internationally known figures such as the famous Dominican Father Tom Burke of the Priory in Tala. The patient reception by a pious audience of a two-hour-long sermon as a way of raising funds for charities seems to be a forgotten aspect of 19th century religion. If new churches were called for, 
in the course of the Victorian era, it was because of the city's ever-expanding population, not so much in the inner city, but in the suburbs to which the professional and merchant classes of Dublin had removed themselves. Let's take the, the, the parish of Donnybrook as an example. The first records of the Catholic parish date from the 17th century, about the 1680s. But at that date, the parish extended far beyond what it is today. It reached from what we now think of as Donnybrook through Irish Town, Rings End, Booterstown, Black Rock, Sea Point, Stillorgan, Kilmacud, Dundrum, and part of Monkstown. A census in 1766 of Donnybrook reveals that this area contained a total of 433 families with 259 papists and 174 Protestants. This district was then more or less a rural environment. However, in 1876, some areas were cut off. In Victorian times, the changes we have alluded to led to the creation of the new parish of Haddington Road. This included what local people call the roads, that is, Clyde Road, Ragnan Road, Elgin Road, and Northumberland Road, all of which came into existence in or around the 1860s, a district of prosperous people, many of them Catholic. For St. Bartholomew's in Clyde Road is a high Anglican church, but it is built on a much smaller scale than Haddington Road. The new church at Donnybrook was promoted in 1860 and after by Father Patrick Nolan. He was an energetic man and even obtained a donation from the Empress of Eugenie of France, a great patron of Catholic cause, causes. But Father Nolan was also active in the suppress suppressing the medieval Donnybrook Fair, here painted by Erskine Nichols, um, between 1855 and 1859, arranging for the patent to be bought out from the family that then held it. The raucous and often unseemly behaviour at that Rabelaisian event, often of 10,000 people, did not tone in well with the new social ambiance and respectable ambitions of the district. This is an urban example of the suppression of traditional activities in rural Ireland, especially those involving drink and the meeting of sexes, in preference to, for, to new forms of devotion, such as Corpus Christi processions, sodalities and fraternities. As the population inexorably rose in this area, new churches were erected to meet the perceived need. However, it is an irony of history these parishes largely created in Victorian times are now foreseen as having to re-amalgamate in the coming decades. The expansion has ceased and contraction is developing. The wheel has turned. The Catholic Church, far from expanding, now, now sees itself as imploding as fewer and fewer priests, a mere handful to what would have been available in the 1870s, come forward and communicants continue to fall. Whatever we say architecturally about these churches, the fact is they, the fact remains that they were created to serve people and with the decline, not of those who call themselves Catholics, um, but of those who go to church, falls year on year, their future is in doubt. These churches that I've been talking about were all in Pembroke Township. Let us now turn to Rath Mines and to Rathgar. This, of course, is the great dome of the church in Rathmines. Crossing the bridge at Rathmines, we are faced with the impressive structure of Rathmines Parish Church set in a long row of late Georgian houses, now, alas, badly decayed, their, pro the pro their prosperous homes of the Queen's reign having been replaced by bedsits and flats, their front gardens built over for shops. This church was quite in keeping with the high expectations of prosperity which the church had for its adherents living in the township. Indeed, its magnificent copper dome is unrivaled in the city and can be seen to loom over the rooftops from quite far away. It looks almost like a minor Roman cathedral in itself. Certainly, Rathmines had ambitions as the size of the town hall, the public library, and the technical school creations of the, of the end of our period all illustrate. But it's striking that as one moves further into the district, the churches change and perhaps grow a little smaller and neater. This is the 
interior of the three patrons. On Rathgar Road, the three patrons is a lovely church rather than an impressive one. I've often heard it referred to as the servants' church, which, given the social nature of the surrounding roads, seems very strange. The three patrons was for prosperous Catholics, many of them well placed, as the memorial tablets inside suggest. It was here, for instance, that James Joyce's mother sang in the choir. In those days when women were still allowed to sing in Catholic church choirs before new church regulations forbade this in the early years of the 20th century. Further on, we find another church at Terra Nure in Joyce's days, living in Brighton Square. This was a chapel of ease, one, one, which, one where the baptism of little James was recorded. It was replaced as the pop, again as the population grew with a much larger church. The march into the growing suburbs continued southward. The same spread of population and houses occurred on the north side in Drumcondra and Clontarf, and these carried over into the early part of the 20th century. There's nothing here to rival the magnificent of, of mountain mines, perhaps because this was because this was a middle class and lower middle class district, a district of higher clerks and civil servants rather than bankers and merchants, as was the case in Pembroke and Rathmines. It's significant perhaps that Arthur Griffith, who did so much to initiate the creation of, new, of a new Ireland, lived here in St. Lawrence's Road in a neat red brick home gifted to him by friends on his marriage. For it was his kind of people and the people who thought the same way that would have the making of modern Dublin. The Victorian inner city, however, was different. So let's turn back to look at it. I'd like to say a few words about the parish churches, but more about the order churches. In the city, there had been, of course, medieval churches. After the Reformation, they passed into Anglican position. For Catholics, there were, however, the mass houses, as the temper of the times allowed, and then the chapels finally giving way in the second half of the 18th century to larger buildings, the same pattern we have seen already. By the way, I should add, perhaps by way of a parenthesis, that there was then, and for a long time, remained a distinction between chapel and church. A church in 1800, or indeed in 1837, was an Anglican edifice, a chapel and a Catholic or non-conformist one. I use the term church here as an indication of size, but this older usage persists in some areas and in many parts of the country, people often using the term chapel without a thought, just as they refer to Donnybrook or Haddington Road rather than the Sacred Heart or St. Mary's. This is a Victorian usage which persists down to this day among Dublin Catholics. This is Walter Osborne's painting of St. Patrick's Close. It presents a sort of a romanticization of Dublin's poverty. During the Victorian period, the inner city was remarkably prosperous places in some ways, despite all that is said about its poverty. Cleary is one of the great landmarks of our city under its original name of Max Sweeney and Delaney was, so I think, the very first purpose-built department store in the world. It was a product of the decades after the famine, which are often seen as a period of disaster and decline. But the city was a lively place, as we have seen in Ulysses. James Joyce, for instance, thought that Capel Street, illuminated for Christmas, was one of the most beautiful streets in Europe. The background squalor to Joyce's Dublin at the end of the period has not escaped very critical examination. We've heard some of it today. There were, of course, the districts of great poverty that cannot be denied. Where am I? Where's Faddles Lane? Oh, there's Faddles Lane. Yeah, Faddles Lane. In the summer of 1861, a mid-Victorian date, a Dublin Corporation official, a Catholic by faith, published a report on the state of the city's houses. Indeed, it falls in between the two um, uh, surveys, many surveys that we've heard at the beginning and end that were discussed earlier. There were then in the city boundaries, the two canals, some 8,000 houses let out in multiple tenant occupancy. The poverty of these people was so great that in 1860, some 19,045 room keepers were relieved by the Sick and Indigent Room Keepers Society 
the city's oldest charity. The official had surveyed some 134 streets and lanes. The average number of persons to each house was 300, uh, to each street rather, was 300 to 888. The average to each house was 19.19. To each room was 3.595. To each bed, 2.515. What, what lot rather uh, is astonished at the, the mathematical accuracy of this enumeration of poverty. The rents changed from six ch ch charged ranged from sixpence to two shillings a week. Between 1835 and 1853 and 1860, he reported, some 3,541 filthy and overcrowded lodgings had been suppressed by the authorities. To meet all these needs, there were then only two model lodgings in the whole city. As a social partner, it would seem that the Catholic Church in Victorian Dublin, though it engaged charitably with the squalor around its churches, failed to push towards a true social solution because of the interests of the class from which the clergy sprang. Modern Catholic social thinking and teaching derives, of course, from Rerum Novarum at the end of the, the century. That poverty was in part due to the flight of the merchant class over the course of the Victorian era from the inner city to the suburbs. They no longer wished to live above the business, as merchants had done since medieval times. The effect on their rates was enormous. The corporation was left to carry the burden of the inner city while the townships prospered. Um, for the Catholic Church, there was then a large population. One could see this in such churches as St. Paul's on Iron Key or the Church on Blind Key, Lower Exchange Street, rather, nearly opposite it. But at the end of the period, these churches were already looking out of place. For it's not the parish churches that are the real pride of the inner city, but the order churches. Those of you who grew up in the 1950s um, will recall that the Dublin custom of visiting seven churches to pray on Holy Thursday. For Dubliners of a certain generation, it gave a sense of intimacy with far more churches than anybody living in the country. For this purpose, the order churches in the city centre were very popular. It was inevitable that only two or at most three of them could be parish churches. The others were nearly always order churches. Clarendon Street, Whitefriars Street, Merchants Quay, Gardner Street, now of course a parish church, and above all, St. John's Lane, which is in the slide. I mention this because the famous bird's eye view engraving of the city, which I used at the beginning of this show, shows the great tower of St. John's rise over the roofs of the poor and the impoverished like a great beacon, one of the most prominent landmarks in the city. Certainly it looms, this is its interior, by the way, certainly it looms, Certainly it looms large in the foreground of the intertitle of the, the, from the 1890s that I used earlier. It was called the Fenians Church because it was said that its labourers, the labourers who built it in the early 1860s were supporters of the Fenians, if not actual members of the Brotherhood. But this points to an important fact. The order churches were popular churches. They were the people's churches in a special way. And to this day, this remains the case as anyone who visits Whitefriars or Clarendon Street, Merchants Quay or St. John's Lane can see. This, incidentally, is Whitefriars as it was in the, in the beginning of the Victorian era, late Georgian. And you'll see that actually here, that it's divided across by a, a barrier with pews at the front and the people at the back have to either stand or kneel on the cold stone. Again, the same, a repetition of the same social division between the parishioners that we saw earlier. This, however, taken in, the, in Merchant's Key in the 1930s, I suspect, is the sort of ceremonial of the Catholic Church at very nearly its highest form. The black drape suggests it might possibly be a funeral, but I'm not certain about that because the, it's a, it came from a private collection and is uncaptioned. But you'll see the, the ordered ranks of people wearing their academic gowns 
and the bishop in his full regalia, and uh, the people, the, pe- the people of, of uh, the, the lesser people without their gowns over there. Um, this, re- this is an image of the Catholic Church at its perhaps highest epoch at the time of the Eucharistic Congress, um, from which it might perhaps be able to see a decline setting in, but that's a, a, a subject for another day. In conclusion to this brief overview, I'd like to leave you with three images of St. Peter's in Fibsborough, the church that I began with. This is as it was at the beginning of Victorian times, one of the pre-emancipation churches. This is how it was in 1900, when the, the Fibsborough had developed, and as probably Fibsborough hasn't looked as good since in some ways, because these shops were all newly built, the banks and buildings on this side were, nearly, were all, all late Victorian and were at their freshest. Um, and here it is, as it is today, stranded in the middle of the rushing traffic of a modern city. The difference between these three pictures is a measure of how the Catholic Church changed so greatly over the course of the Victorian era and now leads a perilous existence in our own times. And there, I think, we can end with the removal of the Queen.